Iran. An interview with Mr. Francis J. Turner, 24 January 2001, Syracuse Armory. Interviewer is Lieutenant Colonel Robert von Hassel. The videographer is Mr. Wayne Clark. Uh, Mr. Turner, tell me about where you were born and raised. I was uh, born in uh, 1918, December 28th, and I was raised in Slicker County around the town of uh, Altmar, Orwell, Richland, Plaskai. That was my stopping area. And I went to Plaskai High School. That's where I went to school. Mm -hmm. What was your family involved in? My father, he was a, a superintendent in charge of a hydro station called Bennett's Bridge up on the Salmon River up near the Redfield Reservoir. And we lived in company houses up there. And I think they had 12 company houses. And, that's, and they were real nice houses, probably some of the best houses, you know, because we had indoor plumbing and so on and so forth. So it was very convenient. Now, what did you do after you graduated high school? I went to college for two years at Sligo State Teachers College, taking industrial arts. And that's when the, the war broke out, and I was inducted into the... Or at that time, they had compulsory military training. Anybody over, I think it was 18 years old, and you had to go and take... If you didn't have a family or anybody and you were single, you had to go and take a year of compulsory military training, which I went in June the 10th, 1941, and then they come along with December the 7th, with Pearl Harbor, and the next morning they, they reveled on the street. They says, you fellows that are in for compulsory military training right now, you're in for the duration. So that's how I got in the Army. Where were you when this happened? Pardon? What uh, What base were you at when you found out? Fort Belvoir, Virginia. Mm -hmm. I was in the engineering school. It was a bit of a shock? Well, uh, uh, what do you mean, Pearl Harbor shock? Yeah. Oh, yes. Yes, right. And uh, what was the amazing thing about it, when we was in the Fort Belvoir, Virginia, and if we wanted to go to uh, Washington, D.C., where all the action was, you could stand out there on that Richmond Highway and you could thumb and nobody would pick you up. But Right after Pearl Harbor, it's different. Boy, they'd stop, they'd pick you up and all. God, they, you know, you couldn't do nothing wrong then. So it, you could see a big change in, in, the, in the whole thing, you know. Yeah, made you feel good. Well, what happened to you after Fort Belvoir? Well, Fort Belvoir, we went to, uh, we trained there, and uh, with our, our uh, uh, machine shops. And I went down to uh, Washington, D.C. to a, a school, machine shop school, and uh, some of the others went to a mechanic school, and some of the others went to welding school, and it, uh, we went down there, we'd go at nighttime. And it's from 11 o'clock till I think it was 4 o'clock in the morning. And then we'd come back, and we did that for a couple of months. Well, then I was assigned a, a, a maintenance in the maintenance platoon, I was assigned the shop truck. I was a machinist, running right? milling machines and uh, and lays and drill presses and so on and so forth. So then we moved out from there. We went to uh, Camp Dix, and we knew then that we was on our way. They just as much as told us so too. So that's how we got overseas, Scotland. What unit were you with? I was with the four seven, the four seventy. Uh, first maintenance engineers at that time. Uh, we were mostly attached to like uh, 31st combat engineers was one. So we'd do the first, second, and third echelon maintenance for them. The other uh, maintenance that, we, uh, that we required more uh, bigger machine shops, that fell over to the ordnance, which was farther back of the, from where we were. So basically you would be helping them take care of their engineering equipment? That is right, yeah. yeah. Yes. What happened at Dix? Pardon? You were at Fort Dix? Yes. What happened next? Well, from Fort Dix, uh, one night, they, we had our uh, barracks bag all packed. We had everything. And they said, any time you'd be called, you can't leave the company area. And after 6 o'clock at night or 8 o'clock at night, you had to be in your barracks. 
so they come about 11 o'clock in the at night and said all aboard or something like that. And they trucked us down to the railroad station and we ended up down in the, uh, New York City down to uh, to get on the boat to go overseas. And here's a Queen Mary sitting there. Boy, and we pulled right down by that and we said, oh, this is great. That thing's a fast boat. We, we'll go on this thing wherever it's going. Yeah, we got surprised. We went around that, went around it. And here's a boat. It was a banana freighter. It was called the Thomas H. Berry. That was what we went overseas on. But we made it. All right. Yeah. You went over as part of a convoy? Yes, yes. Were you concerned about the, the uh, German U-boats? Pardon? Oh, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah, right, yeah. Right. What was it like on the banana boat? Well, it was, it was hectic in eating. Of course, I could eat anything. I, it, that was one of my biggest problems. But boy, well, you'd hit them, uh, I thought it was terrific waves, but I guess it wasn't a small boat like that. You was rocking back and forth, you know, and you had your mess kit and was eating out it. And you put your mess kit down and go through the line and get stuff. And you don't lay it on the table, a big long table. You stand up and eat. If you did, to get away from it. <laughs> could be on the other end. You know, it was, it, well, it wasn't fun, but now I look at it, you know, it was quite an experience. The way did you land in Europe? We landed at uh, Glasgow, Scotland. Mm -hmm. yeah. take, take us from there. What happened next? Well, when we landed at Glasgow, Scotland, we had uh, our uh, company commander. At the time, he was, uh, he, he liked to have everything going. He, he, wanted to, he, he should have been in the uh, Rangers or something, because he was a guy that just wanted to fight. They run this boat that we was on right into a sandbar. And so <coughs> I was talking to a merchant marine on it, and he says, uh, God, I said, they run aground. He says, no, they did, they did it on purpose. I says, what do you mean? Well, he says, this is uh, low tide. And he says they run it in that sandbar because they don't have time to put this in the dry dock or any place to scrape the particles off. And one that the high tide comes in, he says then they'll then they'll back out and they can go out all right. He says that helps get some of the particles off. Mm. Yeah, so that's how we got to Scotland. Then from Scotland, we went down uh, went down to uh, Tewkesbury, England, which is about I think a hundred miles from uh, from London, and we were down there and. Uh, that was something I never saw anything like it in my life. They, they, they had, there was probably, uh, oh, they probably at least six foot high. They would have probably about three of them, one, two, about three of them the length of this room, two of them anyway, so that you couldn't go fast on them. And the purpose of that was so that the German troops couldn't land gliders in these big fields where we were. Mm -hmm. and, and they had it. And, there was no signs and directions where to go. You had signs that if you wanted to go to London, it might say north or south, or it might be the next day it might say something else and didn't get the, the, the different codes. You know, they didn't say London this way and Tewkesbury that way and, and so on and so forth. And it was, they was well, they was, you could see they were well in the war. And boy, they suffered. And the one amazing thing was that you go along the road and you, you'd see uh, these great big pyramids like that solid cement and they'd be put on each side of the road and then some places they'd have, they'd have these uh, great big round balls so the time coming the chains or big chains on them I suppose that if, if the Germans invaded they would take a dead on some of these main highways they would cut them so they would roll down on the highway that they couldn't go out any farther than that because there'd be minefields out there. So it was, it was quite a thing to see. Those people were really, they really knew what war was. Yeah. Now, how long were you in England? Uh, we was in England till we uh, sailed with a big uh, outfit. They trucked us up to uh, Swansea, Wales. I can't tell you just how long we was in England. I'd probably say uh, three months, maybe. And they put us up to uh, Swansea, Wales, and we got out. The, we had we put us on a big boat, the Empress of India, and we sailed. We didn't know where we was going, but we was glad when we got out to sea because it was a nice little rain, and we was laying there on the deck, and it was nice and warm, and that's what we liked. 
instead of foggy England, you know, where you're, I don't know, just put chills through you. So, so from there we went on, we got out in the Atlantic Ocean, all of a sudden we met a great big convoy coming from the States. So uh, how we knew where we was going, we kept going and going. And, and uh, one of the places, uh, about two days before we went to Gibraltar, our uh, boat we was on, all of a sudden it took a great big uh, left turn. And it really went up. And uh, they blew the whistles, or whatever they did, I forget that, I think it was they blew the whistles. And you're supposed to go below deck. Well, they spotted the German submarine, and you could hear them drop the depth charges. The depth charges. Well, after, after a while, they said uh, we could come up on deck, and uh, that the uh, emergency or how they explained it was over then. So, I was down below. I was about three stories, I guess, down below of that boat, and sweaty and hot, and. This one fellow, he was a, never forget him, he was a lawyer from uh, Niagara University. He just graduated but never had, that never had to uh, time to get his uh, regular law, de law degree, you know, because so, he hadn't tried that yet, but he just had to come into service. He's down there, we're all nervous, no question about it. He come down there and he almost had a roll of money on He pulled out of his pocket. He said, 10 to 1, they don't sink us. Well, you know, bought a few smiles from some of us. Well, then when they let us go up on the deck, it was up there, and there was a, a colonel on that boat. He was uh, either an a infantry colonel or, a, or one in the artillery, but he had a big pair of glasses. And I happened to be standing there beside him. And, uh, and you could see something way out there, a dot, and a couple of ships around it. And uh, somebody said, uh, uh, what are they doing, see? And uh, he didn't know who said it. We was all standing there, you know, where he was, and looking out there. And he says they bought the submarine up. They got it up, they're taking the crew off of them. And uh, so I said, they are? He said, yeah, here, you want to see? He <laughs> looked at it, very nice, yeah. yeah so they, they took the crew off it and then they sunk it. I, I, I don't know if it was sinking or what, but they took the crew off it, but I know they sunk it. it, it it's gone anyway. Yeah. So then we thought that was that was quite an experience. And two days later, two days later, we come up with well, all the lights on, rock and Gibraltar. Well, we knew where we was going then. We was going over to the Mediterranean someplace, or Sicily, Italy, or France, or we didn't know where. So we went, and then we beat, you, everybody had spies in there, they had to have spies there in Gibraltar because that, anything go through there, they could see it, there's no question about it, they had, had agents all over. So I imagine by the time they, they had things figured out where it was going, and we went into Oran in North Africa. So that's all I got in Africa. <laughs> and what were your duties and missions in North Africa? Repairing equipment. Right. They started us to work after about four days when we got our uh, equipment off, the boats. And we got it in, the, the, we took it and we went out, uh, outside of Oran, about four miles out, and there we uh, set up our, our camp, so on and so forth. Yeah. What kind of equipment was coming in for repairs? Well, mainly it would be, uh, well, for instance, uh, up with the uh, uh, the combat engineers, when this working, they did have, uh, uh, for instance, uh, these uh, Thor jackhammers, and uh, they would have trouble with them. The pistons in them uh, that go up and down to three inches. I used to know them right down in the millimeters. They would take and swell out, and they would clog up. And they couldn't work. They couldn't work the darn things. We had them coming in. They'd bring them in for repairs. So. We worked and worked, and we found out that the best thing to make them out of, we tried case hardening them, so on and so forth. But then we found out we get these axles out of uh, out of German uh, weapon carriers, and that was good hard steel. While well, we would anneal that steel over a bed of charcoal, and kneel it to get it down to take the temper out of it, and then we'd take it and we'd turn it down on the lathe put them in the lathe, 
and turn them down. Then after we turned them down, uh, then we would take a temper of them again. And it took us, probably we had to make 30 or 40 of these, had three machine shop trucks, trucks making So we finally stumbled on the right one and how to do it, how to get the right temper in them. They lasted good. Uh, the amazing thing is that on anything like that, you, you figure, well, why don't they manufacture that right? in the states. And don't they test it or not? You say to yourself, we found out later that the Thor company, I think it was in Ohio, that they they had a, I didn't know this until afterwards, three, four months afterwards, there's somebody from the Thor company that was over there that, to see how their, their equipment was going. So that probably, there's no doubt that was corrected, you know, before the year was up. So that's how much of people were, there's, Quite a few people over there like that that were representing companies, which was sort of hard to believe, but I've seen one of them, yeah. I didn't see this guy with, with Thor, but I saw one that was with, uh, uh, um, playing the, oh, when the fighter, when the airplane fighters move up, they would lay their pipes with gas lines and so on and so forth. And this, this guy represented some kind of a, Pipe, pipeline outfit. Yeah, his name was Rush from uh, New Jersey or something. So. Did you find uh, you would have to do a lot of field expedients, uh, you know, extemporize, improvise? Oh, yes, yes, absolutely. So, yes. other equipment other than the jackhammers? Pardon? Uh, with other equipment other than the jackhammers? Oh, yes, yes, right. So, uh, especially uh, road graders. And uh, 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 our four uh, uh, Caterpillar tractors and the big D7 tractors, maybe a Bulgari would break on them or something, or a bushing would bust or wear out, and we'd have to make them. And I had to make a lot of rings for uh, our for the engine for the combat engineers' half tracks. They had a white motor around them. That white engine. That white engine. It was a good motor, but that white engine, if they started that up, like if they had an alert, they started up, and it's a cold morning. When they would start, if they didn't let that engine idle for probably a good five minutes at least, those, uh, those rings in there that was on the piston, they would break. So it wasn't a matter of how to make those rings or anything, it was a matter of something is probably wrong with that engine. So then they, I made a lot of rings for them, they would bust them. But then they found out if if you take warm this engine up and then it, it'll heat up slow and those rings will expand because those rings was made out of cast iron. They would expand in the, the right the way they're supposed to be and the engine's all right. So this is different things they had to learn and you know, stumble on, right. It sounds like your machine operation was fairly comprehensive. You could do just uh, quite a number of things. Yes, yes, right. Yes. Did you find that the types of equipment that you were repairing changed based on the nature of the operations that the engineers were doing? Like, for example, was it different in North Africa versus... Uh, no, no, no. The outcome we was, we was the same all the way, all the way through. Italy, France, up through to Germany and so on and so forth. Yeah, everything was a, it was a same. We got learned quite a bit of the experience afterwards. Did you ever get an opportunity to, to get away from your job and see some of the localities? Yes. You? Yes, we got, uh, they almost uh, devoted me as a sergeant at the time, but we was up, we was up, uh, uh, we was uh, about 10 miles the other side of, oh, I can't think of the name of the place now, it was up the next big city above uh, Rome. And we was, we was up there and we no sooner got up there than we had uh, orders, uh, they stopped us, they had orders for us to leave their vehicle, leave our vehicles right there, all of our equipment. We was moving up the front. I don't know how far up it was going to go, so on and so forth. So uh, we wondered what this was all about. So we had us leave our 
the equipment there. And uh, then they took us over to the sporter pool, and we had to drive these uh, vehicles that uh, we was assigned to, to drive them back to Naples. So I says, okay, it's going to take us a couple, a couple days to get back to Naples. But when another fellow and myself, when we got to Rome, we said, hey, we, we got to go over here to the Vatican. You know, we got to see the Vatican. So we stayed an extra night on the road there. And they found out about it. And so they called me and, you know, and bawled me out, which they had the right to do, and told me, you're late. The rest of them got in. There's five of you that are late. So I typed that. Well, to be honest with you, I said, I know I have to get punishment or something. I said, if I figured I'm over here, I'll probably never get over here to see the Vatican again in my life. So I said, that's what I did. Well, they just bawled me out. They didn't do anything. Yeah. So didn't degrade me or anything. But that's what we went back for because then they put us on a big Coast Guard vessel and then we went on not the invasion of southern France. The infantry had already gone in. I think we went in there uh, two or three days after the invasion and the, uh, that's when I got soaked good. The weather was great, the water was warm, but just getting off this big Coast Guard vessel and keep running around with these Coast Guard or Navy guys with these landing crabs you get in there, you know, they drop the front of it down. Well, then they make so much waves that the, the, the thing was rough. So he'd get right up near shore, you know. Then all of a sudden he'd take that big motor on the back and curl it around and just put it in reverse, you know, and it would stop that thing. The front end went down and sunk in the water, come in right up to our shoulders. <laughs> Why was we bad? Cigarettes wet and everything. So, so uh, Welcome to France. Ah, oh, yeah, welcome to France, right. Marseille, France, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, now from that point, you, you, I take it you were part of the Seventh Army and you were moving up uh, through southern France. Yes, we, uh, you know, we were the Seventh Army, and then we were the, yes, we moved all the way up through to, to uh, I think it was all the way up through to Luxembourg, to Dijon first, and then over to Luxembourg. And uh, finally, we ended up in Germany, up at uh, Mannheim, right. Germany. Now, the Fifth Army come in there someplace, but I didn't know because you never know if you went from one outfit to the other, you know, they just you know, give you patches. And I, you keep switching this around. Uh, what, um, were there any changes to your mission, or basically you're performing the same mission? Perform, performing the same all the while, right? Was there ever a point where you felt you were in danger of the air or ground attack? Well, yes, yes. But what we were, we were, we were mostly, uh, I would say, 20, 20 miles. They wouldn't let us go up with our uh, shop trucks until they knew that uh, the infantry and the uh, artillery had control of everything. So they couldn't get back at us. But they would come over at night and strafe you for Bobby if they figured they knew where you were. But we we got strafed several times, but we never got the we, we never got barbed. And we didn't get we didn't get to suffer any casualties by getting strafed because they, they must you know, just strafing, right? But there's one thing that I'll never forget when we was in North Africa, they surrendered to Cape Bottom Peninsula, I forget how many thousand, two, three hundred thousand of Italians and Germans. Well, anyway, after that, that was over, we would sit down. We was in Mature at the time, and Mature was about uh, ten miles from uh, Mazurda. Well, Mazurda at the time was getting loaded with, with uh, boats to get ready to go for another invasion someplace. They had a big harbor there, and then out on the Mediterranean. And at nighttime, they would come over, and we've had our shop truck set up there at this place at Mature, and it's right in big olive groves. And at nighttime, a German plane would come over to take pictures. That's all that he was supposed to do. Well, he'd come over, and then on the way back, he'd drop what few bombs he had on. He'd drop them. And maybe they do damage, and maybe they wouldn't. So after three, four nights of this, 
pretty regular every night he'd come over. This one time when he come over, they were shooting. Shooting. Uh, I found out later on, like, for instance, that there was a ship out there, you know. That ship, it was a destroyer escort or what it was. They weren't supposed to shoot at the plane. You shoot right in this area. And this gun position shoot in that area. And they had different ones around. So they just made a lane here. There was nobody in it. So that pilot, from that German pilot, he had a 200 plane. When he'd come around, he'd turn around, and when he started back, he'd have to, instead of running into all that fire, he'd just follow that lane where there was nothing going on. Well, then this one night, there was, I think they called him a black widow. There was a British fighter plane, a two-engine fighter plane. We, we could hear, we, we could hear the German turn around way up above us, and he was on his way back. And he's flying right down that lane, and of course we didn't think too much of it. All of a sudden, right back on the spotlight came on him, and boy, they shot him down. They shot him down right into a big fuel dump. <laughs> that burned for two, three days. I'll never forget that. That was we had a ringside seat for that one. Yeah. Did you get a chance to spend any time with uh, the French civilian population? No, only just when we get like uh, maybe a couple of days off to go into. Uh, you know, going to town or something like that, like in Dijon, France. Why? Why? Well, yeah, we spent quite. Uh, we probably there two months in Dijon, France, with our uh, set up there, and uh, so every night, most Sunday, we could we could go down to Dijon, you know, and have a few wines, a few of their wheat beer, and so on and so forth. You know? yeah. But what was it like when you got into Germany? I imagine the civilian population and environment well, was much different. Well, yes, it, it was It was an awful lot of difference. Uh, that they were a little bit more, you know, uh, like they didn't care too much for us or something. But the whole thing about it, uh, that I will say that it's different than the rest of the wars, the Vietnam, the Korean wars, what I've read about. When we was there, they respected us. You had the American flag on your shoulders, on your badge. They knew you were you was Americans. They they knew what you were. If, uh, nowadays, if you if uh, I I know that some of these armies nowadays in the Vietnam Korean War, you know, it's like well, what the Sam Hill you here for, you know? But at that time, that era that I was in there, that you did that they they respected. Even a lot of times, the enemy was pretty good and they had to respect you too. And I thought. That So, were you in uh, <clears throat> Germany then when the war in Europe ended? Uh, yes, I was in, uh, I think I was, when the war ended, I was in, uh, I was in uh, Metz, Metz, Germany, when the, when the war ended, right? Well, what happened to you after that? Well, when the, when the war ended there, they took in, uh, uh, sent me on a, I could either go for a 10 day, they called it recuperation uh, uh, leave. I could either go down to uh, the Riviera or I could go to England. Well, I thought that uh, I would like Scotland better. I'd been into Glasgow, Scotland, and I wanted to go to Edinburgh, Scotland. So uh, I went on to leave to. Uh, Edinburgh, Scotland. Well, then while I was in Edinburgh, I got back to uh, London, got down to, uh, uh, forget the name of uh, the seaport down there, about 60 miles south of London, to go over to Cherbourg, and we was in this great big area, I don't know, I, there was probably a, a 500 great big criminal tents, you know, six guys in it, bunks. And that's when the war ended in Japan. And man, I'm telling you, that I think it was a 101st or something like that airborne division. They had high points. And we was right behind them. We had high points, too. For this. They was letting you go home by the high points you had. Well, boy, those guys, they were shooting their guns off in the air and everything else. Man, I'm telling you, they were so happy because they was going to be on their way. So uh, I'll never forget that night. And I. 
Then when I got back, my outfit had moved. It split up two, three different times while I was gone. So I had a hard time finding out where my outfit was. And then when I did find out my outfit, it was a new, new first sergeant from the, uh, just come over, I guess, or something. So he said, you're late, you're getting back. I said, yes. I said, I've been here at a time if somebody told me where I'd been. I was traveling around looking for, you know, to find this place and that place to find out where our outfit had gone, see. So after a while, I, I found it. So I told him, I said, so he said something, you know, he said, well, you're late, you know. I want to have some kind of uh, something here to do. And I said, yes. I said, I spent a lot of time finding it. I said, I'm pretty tired. I'm like a two-day pass to see what's going on around here. He looked at me, wrote out the pass. He says, here. So he's pretty good. Yep. And that's then from then on, why we just kept splitting up and splitting up. And you never know who, where he's going to end because they take the high points. I think we had, we had real high points for the number of uh, months you've been overseas, and when they sent us home, we had high points, and you keep going to this outfit, and you're going to that outfit, so you never knew who you was going to end up. So I think in our company, I think of 90 men, I'd probably come home with about uh, uh, 20 of us, between 20 and 30 of us on the boat when we, when we come home. And that was quite an experience coming home, too. We got off the we sailed out of uh, Rotterdam, and we got out on the English Channel, and down off the coast, the southern coast, we hit a hurricane. And we was on the, a Liberty boat, and the captain was a Norwegian captain. And while we was on there, we hit a, uh, this hurricane, and that boat went up and down, up and down, you, you, you had to stay below. We didn't eat for a couple of days because the mess kitchen, you know how they got that all. You can just hear the pots and pans just going back and forth, you know, so don't get off the hangers. Well, what I was worried about, that, that ship, I was afraid that I knew there's mines in those waters. The Germans had them there, and England had them, probably we had them. And I was just afraid we were going to hit one of those mines if you let loose, you know, and uh, get laid, we'd hit one of them. But we didn't. But the captain of that boat, <coughs> he said uh, to us, he said, we got, I got you on this boat, he said, you know, he said, uh, you think you're riding, you, you're uh, got a rough ride now, he said, you're going to get a rough one. So he says, what I'm going to do, he says, I'm blowing all the ballast out. And uh, he says, the reason why I'm doing that, because he says, Kaiser did a good job building these boats. They have been known to break up. A few of them. He said, This one isn't going to break up. So, <coughs> yep. So we bobbed along, and uh, it was pretty rough. And so then we got, uh, he said, I'm going to have, I'm going to get you into Boston. He says, That's where we're going, to Boston. He says, I'm going to get you into Boston. He said, you're not going to have a broken ship. He said, you might have a broken rib or something, but he said, you wouldn't have no broken ship or sprained wrist or something. Well, we got one great ride for about four days there. And then everything calmed down and it was pretty good. Then we began to eat pretty good. So then we got two days, two days out of Boston. Oh, beautiful ocean, nice and clear. And you, this old Liberty vessel, he was plowing it right along good. All of a sudden, we came up on another Liberty vessel in the water. Well, all of us wondered what he was sitting there for, sitting there, sitting there. We found out afterwards he dropped them. He lost a propeller, so they put a great big hawser rope on to pull him in. So we, we was running late getting into Boston, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'll never forget that. Yeah. Went from Boston, you went to Crowd processing and well, from uh, Boston we went to uh, Cat Mile Sandish, boy, and we stayed there until they uh, sent us to uh, Fort Dix. We stayed there about two or three days, Mile Sandish. Yeah. Go up and eat any time you wanted to, get what you wanted to eat too. That quick time to do the So what did you do after the war? 
Well, I come back home and I uh, I went to uh, I come back home and I was working at the steel plant one year before I come into uh, for six months before I come into a service and I went back to the steel plant and uh, this was a steel company and I was working there for uh, I think for uh, well, I went back. You had to go. Back, you had to go back to your employer where you worked. So I went back, and mm -hmm. they wanted me to go back into rolling mills and that job. I said I don't want any rolling mills. So uh, he said, uh, "Well, the climate manager, of course, that Crucible Steel was a call a co small company then, but one of the biggest in Syracuse, I suppose." I said, "Well, I like the. Uh, I'd like to get in the metallurgy department." Well, you know. Got to know somebody to get in them, you know, and so on and so forth. So, well, I says, all I know is you and the fellows I work with. And this was an employment uh, manager, Art, or somebody, I forget his name. Just then, this guy come in, and his name was Carl Youngs. And he, he come in, and I'm sitting there, and the employment manager's talking to me. He says, hey, he says, uh, you got to find a fellow for the temperature shooter for the metallurgy department. He says so and so. He says is uh, quitting or doing something or health reasons or something. So Art says okay. So uh, yeah, Art says how about taking this guy here? He wants to get in the metallurgy department. Well, he says I don't know if he's had any. Uh, where's he been? I mean that trip. He said he's been over Europe. He's been in Germany. Well, this Carl Young is a metallurgist. He got talking to me and so on and so forth. And uh, he says. Uh, Asked me all about uh, where it was in Germany. He asked me about Mannheim. I said it's laid flat. Yeah, how about Heidelberg? I says I think that the guys that were bombing and so on and so forth, they were architects because I said there wasn't that much damage in Heidelberg. It was a great city, and he well, he was from Heidelberg. <coughs> so he said Art Lucas is the climate manager's name. He says to Art, he says, hire him. I want him. So that's how I got in there. And then later on, I got, I didn't get disgusted with them. I liked them. They're crucible steel, but I got to thinking, well, the orders after the war, the way it come in, and it was doing that before the war, if you, you might, they might tell you at night, or at the end of your weeks that you was working, they, they might tell you that uh, well, next week we don't have enough orders, don't come in until Wednesday. And, or maybe you only get two or three days, you know. Well, here I was, I was ready to get married. I said, man, I said, I, I don't want this. I'm going to get married. I said, man, I want a steady job. So I, I put in for the telephone company, the police department, the fire department, Niagara Mohawk. Well, the first one that hired me that I got, uh, that they sent me a notice or called me, so I went in and I worked for Niagara Mohawk and I worked for him for 34 years. Niagara Mohawk and worked my way up to where I was supervisor of power control, you know, so on and so forth. So that's where I retired from. Well, we're just about down to the bottom of the tape. Um, anything you'd like to add? Anything we didn't talk about that we should have? No, I, I think there's one thing that uh, I would say. Well, one general said that if a if a war is worth fighting, it's worth winning. Well, uh, Vietnam War, Korean War, and everything, you didn't have them all back of you. But us, the World War II, the whole country's back of us. You know, with the women working in the factories and so on and so forth. And I, I, I'm telling you, they were doing their part. And, that, and that's great. The rest of the wars you had since then, I'm sure they haven't done it. When you felt like you were, you felt that, you felt you had the support of everyone at home. Absolutely, absolutely, yes, no question about it, yep. If yep. you look back now, are you proud of what you did during the war? Yes, I am. Mm -hmm. yep. Think you contributed to something? I think so, yeah. Not just me, all the rest of us, all of us, yeah. I don't, you know, it didn't matter what they were, right. Yep. Thank you very much. Oh, good. Thank you.